software architecture checklist. Let's look at all the things you should consider while architecting an application. We shall use example of an e-commerce application for this purpose. The architecture checklist consists of requirements, design, DevOps, system health, infrastructure design, security, performance, and disaster recovery. Let's start with requirements. Functional requirements at the very minimum are made up of objective, actors, and user stories. So here the objective is to build an e-commerce application. Actors are customers and administrators. User stories could be product search, place order, cancel order, add product, and so on. Under non-functional requirements, you want to capture things like number of users to support, data volume, and expected growth. So for example, we have 1 million users to support, at least 10 GB of data, and expected growth is not available at the moment. Now these numbers would be approximate, but they are indicative of the scale we are dealing with. Wireframe is a low fidelity mockup. It shows UI pages you need and how you navigate from one page to another. Here's what login page of our application looks like and we should be able to click through it to view other pages. These pages are not functional but indicative of the interface and navigation flow. Let's look at design now. It's a good idea to do a quick prototype that demonstrates design with at least one end-to-end -end flow with minimum functionality. This will help you optimize your design early on. What protocols are you going to use between the front-end and the server and the application and database? So between front-end and the server, we use HTTP for request response and web sockets for real-time two-way communication, while payload is JSON messages, while application uses JDBC to connect to database. With all the information we have, we should be able to create a high-level logical architecture now. This is what our high-level logical architecture may look like. Mobile and web apps send requests to a broker which in turn forwards the requests to microservices. In addition, we have data stores, messaging bus, analytics and search. Once we have the logical architecture, we should be able to create a high level technical architecture. In our technical architecture, we clearly identify what tools and technologies are in use. So, in our case, we will be using Lambda functions, AWS step functions, DynamoDB, S3, Kinesis, and so on. And it clearly shows how these components interact with one another. Since we are using microservices, we will list all the microservices we will use, their request response payloads, and how inter-microservices communication happens. Our microservices are order service, product service, user service, search service, etc. An example of a request response payload is shown here, which is a JSON message. And inter-microservices communication happens via a messaging bus. Web UI design where we identify the framework we are going to use, any further details with respect to MVC and JavaScript libraries. So our web application would be a single page application using AngularJS framework. And since this has an MVC design, we identify controllers, routes and views. 
In addition, we specify any other JavaScript libraries we plan to use. For mobile application, we will identify supported operating system devices, the type of application, and design details. Here we are supporting Android and iOS devices, and we will develop a native app. And design will include things like activities, views, and controllers. Data design. Here we identify all the data stores, their respective designs, and data lifecycle. Here we will be using MySQL to store orders information, MongoDB to store clickstream data, and S3 to store images. For the MySQL RDBMS, we would be identifying all the tables, primary keys, foreign keys, indexes, and so on. In case of MongoDB, we will be identifying documents, partitions, shard keys, and so on. With respect to data lifecycle, orders data must be retained for five years, while clickstream data is to be retained for one year. Let's look at DevOps now. For code repository, we have repository type, how it is organized, branching strategy, and tagging conventions. We will be using JIT repository with every microservice in its own repository and a new branch for every new feature. For release tagging, we follow a preset convention. Here we identify CICD tools, CICD pipeline, and deployment triggers. AWS code pipeline is our CI/CD service. Next, we identify the structure of our code pipeline and it includes AWS code build and code deploy. Our deployment triggers are as follows. To the dev environment, code commit, while deployment to test and prod environment is triggered manually. In order to create the infrastructure necessary for the project, Let's see what tools and scripts we can use. So we will be using Terraform to create, manage our infrastructure. And for this, we identify the necessary scripts. System health. For logging, we will identify a logging strategy and tools to use. Our logging strategy is centralized logging, whereby all application components send their logs to a centralized location. And since we are on AWS, we can use CloudWatch logs for this. For monitoring, we will identify the tools and any thresholds and alarms we need to set. We can use AWS CloudWatch for this and set alarms using it. Infrastructure design. What are the various types of environments we have? We will have a dev, QA, and a prod environment. What is the physical location of the environment, network topology, and how is routing done? Since we are on AWS Cloud, a lot of this information is in AWS terminology. Our primary region is US East 1 with a failover region in US West 1. Networking is via VPCs and it must be further elaborated. Routing from the end user to the application is via Route 53 to load balancing. The infrastructure and networking is best explained with the diagram. And such a diagram should identify all important infrastructure components and how they are related to one another. And the infrastructure itself would be created ideally by infrastructure as code scripts, 
like those of Terraform or CloudFormation. Security User management and authentication and authorization. Amazon Cognito is used for user management as well as authentication and authorization of users. Securing the web traffic and data at rest and in transit. Web traffic can be secured with a secure version of HTTP that is HTTPS while the data that is in the data center that is at rest or in transit can be encrypted and the keys managed by AWS KMS, the key management service. Application security, firewalls and DDoS prevention. AWS WAF or Web Application Firewall can prevent SQL injection and cross-site scripting like attacks based on configuration, while AWS Shield will protect against distributed denial of service attacks. Performance If we plan to use caching, what is our caching database, what to cache, and what is our cache eviction strategy? Redis is our cache database. It caches product information, which is accessed frequently but does not change often. And our cache eviction timeout is 24 hours. Scaling of application servers and databases. Application servers are configured to scale automatically. For example, in AWS Auto Scaling Group, EC2 instances are automatically added based on load. Databases are monitored for data growth, query response times, CP utilization, etc. and are scaled based on need. CDNs can help improve performance by bringing the data closer to the end user. So what is the type of CDN we want to use and what is the caching strategy for that? We will use CloudFront as a CDN and cache static files and maybe some API responses. Disaster recovery. We have essentially two kinds of backups to take care of, code backups and application data backups. Our code is in JIT repository and it can be backed up into an S3 bucket and regular database backups can also go to S3. So what's our failover or disaster recovery strategy and who manages that and what are the timelines? We will have two deployments of our application in an active passive configuration. So if the primary or active deployment goes bad, we should fail over to the passive deployment which becomes the new active deployment. And this kind of failover can be managed by Route 53. And we should be able to fail over as quickly as possible. In this diagram, you can see that US East 1 region has our active deployment while there is a passive or a standby deployment in US West 1 region. If our deployment in US East 1 region becomes unreachable or non-functional, we can activate the US West 1 region and Route 53 can direct all new requests to the US West 1 region, resulting in a successful failover. So that was our software architecture checklist.